I'm John Copanza. I work for the Council on Rural Development. And we are sort of the organization uh, that is working with the Town of Dorset and the Dorset Energy Committee to put together uh, this event that you've all come to uh, take part in today uh, called Dorset Tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to be the facilitator for this session. So what I'm going to do to start things is just give you a little orientation about what this is all about. And then we'll go around the room really quickly and do very quick introductions. And then, um, and then we'll get right into it. You know, the, the, the real goal for today, what we are, um, our mission is to hear from you all and to really hear your ideas and your sense of how things are in Dorset. And so what you'll see is you're going to hear from me a little bit at the beginning, but really most of this is about hear, hearing from you. So what's this all about? Uh, first of all, uh, let me tell you very quickly about the Council on Rural Development. We are a uh, nonprofit organization uh, in Montpelier, and our real mission is to help communities rally together, identify things they want to do as a community, and figure out how to move those priorities forward. Some of you may be familiar, uh, there was a process a few years ago in, in the neighboring community of Manchester called Manchester 2020. Did anyone here, anybody familiar with that? Well, so that was a program that uh, BCRD facilitated. The program that uh, we're, we are uh, uh, implementing today is called the Climate Economy Model Communities Program. And uh, it's kind of a mouthful, but the idea is uh, the Town of Dorset and the Dorset Energy Committee applied in a competitive process to participate in this program. And what we will do over the next few months is have a series of conversations around things that you all um, decide are important uh, to do here in Dorset. And uh, so today is really about brainstorming some possible ideas for things you want to do. A month from now, uh, we'll come back and we'll make some decisions about what are priorities that you want to focus on. And then even further down the road a month later, uh, what we will do is we will come together as task forces to move to make those priorities work. Yeah, let's make so for today's session, uh, we, we have about an hour, a little over an hour, and here's how it's going to go. We're going to spend the first, so first of all, the subject of the conversation for this, this particular meeting is around energy generation, energy efficiency, renewable energy. Uh, we're going to spend 10 minutes talking about sort of the existing lay of the land. What are the assets related to energy generation and energy efficiency? What are some of the challenges related to that topic? And then we're going to spend the bulk of this uh, forum really throwing out ideas. What, what could Dorset do around uh, the topic of energy? What are some ideas around energy? Uh, and then finally, at the end of the conversation, the last 10 minutes of the conversation, as you saw, there's some folks with name tags. Those are members of our visiting team. And they are going to share some reflections uh, at the very end of the conversation. I, my job is to be the facilitator for this conversation. I really, uh, and let me introduce Madison, who works uh, for the Regional Planning Commission. As you can see, uh, Madison's got a laptop on her lap. So, and what that does is it means I don't have to have those big pads and pieces of paper writing things down. Uh, Madison is taking notes from this conversation. Because what's going to happen after today is we're going to have notes from each one of these forums. We're going to bring all those notes back together. I'm going to read those notes a few times, and I'm going to uh, sort of do what we call a cluster analysis. There are going to be some ideas that come up again and again in the notes, and that's when you, you, you know you've got something, and so we'll sort of take all of those disparate ideas, we'll put them into some key action ideas, and that's what we will come back a month from now, we'll come back to Dorset, and those ideas will present, be presented back to you uh, for some prioritizing of what you all want to focus on. So thank you, uh, Madison, for taking notes. So um, with that, I think uh, we should get started with this. And, um, 
as we think about energy generation and energy use in this community, uh, I want you to think about it a few different ways. This is a community conversation, so you might think about it as a community, but the reality is we all are dealing with energy uh, in our homes and you know in our transportation. So don't just think about it from a community perspective. It's also really helpful, actually, to have in this conversation your personal experiences around this, right? Uh, we've got partners in the room like Efficiency Vermont and Green Mountain Power who very much want to work with people uh, in Vermont communities to think about their energy use, how to save money on their energy costs, how to reduce their energy use. So actually your personal experiences is part of what we want in this conversation. So with that, uh, let me just open up uh, to say what's the current lay of the land around energy? You know, how, what are your experiences around energy, whether that's heating, whether that's electricity. Uh, I'll, I'll just pause here and see if anybody has any thoughts they want to throw out as we get started. I'll throw something real quick. I've right. lived here about a year now. And um, I think something that, that, that my wife and I did that was uh, uh, worked out well for the community and also for ourselves was putting, going to uh, uh, Green Mountain Power and uh, got involved with the Tesla battery program. And uh, so they've been installed in our home for maybe about six months now, and it took a little while to get in line for everything. It took a little while to get the product. But everyone we dealt with was absolutely professional and couldn't be more helpful. Uh, they came, they installed it. Um, and what I found, because there's a little app that goes on your phone, and you can see that many times the batteries in my house supply power to your house. And this way, Green Mountain Power doesn't have to buy more power. Because the thing about power is, once you buy it or once you make it, you have to use it. Because you can't store it unless you have a battery system. So I think what happens is if more of us got that in the community, you're creating more of a microgrid, for lack of a better term, inside our own community. And we'd be helping each other out, but also you'd be helping yourself out when your power goes out. Because the system is built for if you have a big storm coming at you, it shuts down so you have the battery, you have your battery power. So you, I'm, I'm not necessarily supplying any for you. I'm not going to be worse to wear. And we're all a little greedy here, all right? But, but on a normal day, when the weather is hot, the last couple of days, you can see how the batteries are, are, are going out to the grid to help other people so Green Mountain Power doesn't have to buy extra power that they would end up you know, creating pollution and yada, yada, yada. That's my, All right. That's my bit. Great. So energy storage is an example of a new technology. And what's inter just interesting, what you just heard him describe about that technology is it's providing direct benefits to him as a customer but there's also actually some collective benefits uh, to energy storage as well. Other things that people are uh, are doing or um, or experiencing in relation to energy. And it, it this is sort of we're going to spend about ten or fifteen minutes just talking about the land. land. So actually, let's do it. Bill, go for it. Well, uh, the state of Vermont has determined that the, the two largest segments uh, of energy usage are heating and transportation. And so I'll bring up transportation. I know we're going to talk about transportation later, but electric vehicles. Uh, my wife and I figured out that if we add up how much we pay in fuel, oil changes, mufflers, transmission, it's actually way cheaper to buy an electric car. We happen to have solar to charge it, so we don't actually even pay to charge it. But um, I think Dorset needs to look at uh, charging stations, uh, even charging uh, infrastructure. State of Vermont is a little bit to look at, and I, I think that would be really good to uh, encourage Dorset to do that as well. Uh, quick logistics note, I, I know we uh, sent this around once. We're going to send it around once more because we've added a few more people. So this is a sign that you don't miss it. Uh, go for it. We had an energy audit done at our house a number of years ago, and it was fantastic. We ended up following the recommendations and sending it home, different kinds of insulation. And this is a house that was, our apartment was built in the 1700s. So it did some 
people offering up in a few areas. But it's been fantastic. No more drafts, and the whole thing paid for itself. Like the whole in a very short time. So both an energy audit and then the insulation and all the yeah, work that came as a result. Following the recommendations was probably the, the most important part. You know, I'm going to pause for a second here and say, with this group has grown a lot in the last couple of minutes. Do you guys mind if you kind of round this out here so that we all feel like we're part of it? I'm sorry if you're making me I'm hoping this is the last time. It's great. It's great. So, um, here's a question for a show of hands. Uh, for those of you for heating your home uh, here in Dorset, I'm going to list off some different ways to heat your home, and I want you to raise your hand for the way that you heat, the primary way that you heat your home. And I say primary because a lot of Vermonters heat with a few different uh, different ways. But uh, So I'm just going to list off some different ways to heat, and raise your hand if that's the way you heat your home. So let's start. Fuel oil. How many need fuel oil? Uh, how about propane? How about, um, let's say, cord wood? Does anybody heat primarily with cord wood? How about pellets? Does anybody primarily heat with? Uh, cold climate heat pumps. What about anybody on electric, like electric baseboard heating? Anybody still heating with uh, electric? <laughs> That's not surprising. Not too many of those. What am I missing? Did I miss any uh, heating sources? Solar, I guess. How yeah. About, like uh, pa passive solar. Passive solar. Yeah. A anybody? All right. That's harder to find. Yeah, it's real. Anything else? Did I miss anything else? That's helpful just to sort of get a sense of, of, of where I'm impressed actually with how many hands went up primarily heating with coal climate heat pumps. That's, I think you're, you're more record, that's a greater proportion than probably we would find uh, in, in other, other places. Uh, how much, well, this is less of a show of hands, but how are people experiencing the cost of energy, whether that's the cost of fuels to heat your home, or the cost of electricity, or the cost of gas? Any any sort of reactions or thoughts about that? Yeah? Well, all I can say is that my electric bill is about the same as my gas bill. But it did. Uh -huh. Interesting. Yep. So it might be worth sort of doing some uh, yeah. some diagnostics. Jim, yeah. yeah. I don't know about last month, but everybody needs to pay attention. Speaking of energy costs, and I don't know. Yeah, but if you haven't, you're going to get in the mail a full page letter with your residential uh, and commercial uh, rate billing. And you want to not throw it away like we do with most of that stuff. You want to read it. In it, it's going to describe that you've been getting a federal tax credit uh, reduction over the last, I don't know, year, year and a half, which was a result of the Trump tax plan. That's going to go away on September 30th, I think it is, of this year. It represents about a 6% number of your bill. <clears throat> You're also going to see that we had gotten on last January 1, but it was masked by this tax credit, a 5% rate increase. And on September 30, October 1, you're going to get a 2.9% increase. In addition, there are going to be two other items, and it's labeled as transparency, and, and it is. One is we're going to be, the GMP is going to be charging a fee for. I assume tree removal for the emerald ash borer, and, the, and that's going to be a fixed number. I can't remember. Jeff can tell us it's either 20 cents or so. And then we're also going to get a charge for storm damages, and that's another fixed number. And one or the other is a dollar and something, and one is 20 cents. So my my point is, if you don't pay attention to any of your bills and start thinking about this conversation and how you're going to either reduce it 
or get control of it, uh, this will be a wake-up call to you. Jeff, so you want to add any further articulation? You're only going to get about an 8 to 10% increase in a bill in one shot. Yeah, thank, thank, you, thank you, Jim. I think I think you've hit the numbers right. I don't I don't have all of those numbers memorized, especially the tree clearing one. But but I think that's accurate. Uh, what about those who are heating with fuel oil? What's your sort of experience with costs? How much are you seeing variability? I guess in those costs, any any sense of that? Uh, considerable. Considerable sort of, and I can give you the numbers in a second. I didn't track it at all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah man, I, I can tell. Um, I have a small business that has hot water systems on restaurants and dairy farms, and those people have an arrangement with me and my, and my son. And we watch their fuel prices every quarter when we give them a billing. And propane over the last two to three years has been quite low. Uh, an example in town, a large buyer uh, three years ago was buying at 80 cents a gallon. And remember, propane only has about two thirds or three quarters of the BTUs that a fuel oil gallon does. Last year and, and two years ago, the price went up from about 80 to $1.50. This year it has gone backwards again. And it's in part due to a surplus of propane just because of fracking. It's become Marginally economical for oil people in oil business to go after fracked gas. It's become such a surplus at this current year, right now, that a lot of it's going to be exported. And they're out looking for ports all over the country to um, build or rebuild to export the gas. But point being is, it is very much an up and down motion. And again. I think most of us like to have a control of where we're going and sort of a fixed idea of what we can you know, depend on year to year. And those fuels are going to always have been volatile and they're going to continue. Yes? I come from the part of Pennsylvania where they've done, done the fracking. Uh, and they got in, they got their agreements, they capped most of the wells because they didn't want the price to go down too low. They've also broken many of their agreements with the farmers whose land they cracked up. So they are not necessarily getting the money they would promise monthly as a royalty. People need to be aware of these things. So I think uh, just to sort of set a little further stage, some context is really helpful here, and some of what's going on out elsewhere is helpful. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I intended to say as we started this conversation, this program is really focused on what uh, what actions are possible locally, right? What can you, what's within the control of you all here in Dorset? What can you implement, whether that's you as a homeowner, whether that's you as a community? So uh, it's, we're, we're not an island here in Vermont by any scope, certainly not when it comes to energy and energy costs. So some of that context is helpful. But, uh, but at times, I will bring it back to a question of what, what can we do here in Dorset? What, what's within your control? And what's within your control when you've got some other partners in the room that want to work with you uh, to make, make things happen? So other sort of reflections about energy use for you all or energy generation? Question. Yeah. The heat pump yeah. has been pushed quite a lot, and my hot water is electric and it's failing, and I need to replace it. Yeah. So different people have said to me, "You should do the heat pump," but um, it's very mixed the feedback I'm getting because partly I'm understanding that if it's cold in your cellar, I have a dirt floor of 1860 pounds um, in the cellar, which are floor. Um, it's not meant to be that protected because there's not yeah. a, it's, there's not enough of a difference in temperature. Maybe I'll let Jeff give a quick response to that. <laughs> so we're talking about there are heat pumps to heat the air, and then there's heat pump hot water heaters that you have in your basement that replace maybe your propane or oil hot water heater. And you're talking about that technology. I'll give Jeff a quick chance to just give a, a sense of what that technology is because it's pretty exciting and worth looking into. Yeah, okay. so, so generally they're fantastic. They're not necessarily a fit everywhere. What they do is they work just like any other heat pump. They take heat from the air around them 
and concentrate it and then put it in the water. And so if your basement is really cold, then you might not have as efficient of a heat pump water heater as if it was in a basement that was you know, better conditioned. So the best thing to do is to have somebody take a look and give you some feedback. I know I did, and, and they're sort of like you're gonna have to do a conventional tank. And unless I did a huge upfront investment in electric to get like a water on demand mm -hmm. kind of thing, and that's prohibitive. So I feel like I'm stuck in a, a little bit of a time warp. Yeah. I don't want to get too much into specific troubleshooting, other than I guess the larger message is when you were at that moment of replacing an appliance, like that's the magical moment. And don't shoot past it too quickly. It's worth really evaluating every option and even getting second opinions. Because as soon as you make that investment in whatever the next thing is, you're probably locked into it for 10, 15, or 20 years. So it's a it's worth a deeper dive. Two things on that. Efficiency for mine is quite helpful if you have questions either residential or business. And they're quite helpful with questions like that. But secondly, we do have a Dorset Energy Committee here, and that's what we're committed to doing. So if any of you want to ask initial questions or you want to get the lay of the land so that you can sort of begin to work on your own alternatives, call one of us. We'd be happy to talk to you. That's what we're here for. We get excited. <laughs> <laughs> Those are calls they like to get. <laughs> yeah. Jim, quickly. Oh, right. and, and listening to your discussion about a cold basement, it makes Excellent. me wonder, really, Let's go back to the efficiency insulation question. Is if your basement is that cold, when you think about the theory of insulating a box or a house, the primary things are stopping air leakage and insulating the top and the bottom. If your basement is so cold that we can't get enough heat out of that air so that it's right on the edge of being not becoming freezing but unbearable, I would go to Brock or Christian de Lamont or somebody to get an audit on the house. Mm -hmm. I'd be more worried about that total picture than I, I, did. I, I did. I did all that. Okay. Yeah. And did we do anything for the basement? Um, fault, which I, I just am not keen on fault. No, did want to do it. I didn't want to do the fault part. Okay. So I mean, it's, but it's the big. upstairs is insulated font. It's the basement. It's the foundation where the house needs the, the marble foundation. At the sill. And, uh, All right, let's thing. not go too deep yeah. into this. Although I do, the reason I think it's, a, look, we all, the, the interesting thing about Vermont homes is basically none of them are the same. <laughs> and that presents a real challenge, right? We have massive goals in this state for how many homes we want to weatherize. And when each one of them is required sort of a, a, a relatively deep conversation about what to do and how to do it. Uh, there's not necessarily a cookie cutter approach, um, but I think um, it's, it can be helpful actually to ask that kind of a question in this kind of a venue because there are some real opportunities. Becca, I don't know, you know, Becca's from a, a white here, from Efficiency Vermont. I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add to that in terms of how you might be helpful. Yeah, one thing to say is, oh, so I'm in week three at Efficiency Vermont, so <laughs> I know everything now. Um, but uh, there are a lot of resources we can provide throughout this conversation. And I know you want to save for the end some of it, but something that we can offer, Doris in particular, is free home energy visits done by an efficiency for home professional. So whether you've had one before and you want to re look at some options or you want to start diving in, that's something that we can offer through this program, which could be a great asset for the energy committee. So what are some other um, I want to probably, uh, let's be a little more clear. What are some challenges around energy? Do you, what about outages? Do you guys have pretty good uh, reliability here in the course that people experience when they have? No, we've got batteries, I do. Yeah. <laughs> How about others? Do not many outages, you're, pretty, you're, you're, you're not at the end of the line in terms of the grid. Well, that's because I cut all the, the trees back from the power lines about 15 years ago, when they did a whole thing where they cut all the trees away from it. And that helped a lot. Yep. It's a con that's, that trimming is a constant effort. Ma'am? Yep. Well, two things. So, 
we do have outages where we are we live on a dirt road with lots of trees and it does help that they come every so often to trim the trees back it is noticeable everyone gets upset when they do it but um so i wanted to make that point but you were talking about challenges and i think one of the challenges that has to be addressed is that those of us that have more than one source of heat are not going to give up either one of them probably mm -hmm. so when we push the numbers and we talk about the numbers we have to be realistic because we're not just using solar or just using oil we're doing one or the other because we're trying our best to manage the cost and so if the cost of heating oil goes up we burn more wood wood is expensive and it's time consuming and it's a lot of our own energy that goes into getting you know that wood ready to use for heat but if the cost of oil goes up high enough we don't mind burning yeah. those yeah. burning the wood. but there's lots of people that use more than one source mm -hmm. and i think we have to be careful when we talk about numbers and efficiencies and savings that people are not just doing one thing <clears throat> that, that's a great point. How many people heat with more have more than one heat source in their home? Actually, let's get in. And I know I'm I'm among them. Yeah, look at that's yeah. That's I don't think that's typical around the country, right? As, as an energy auditor, I can say that I'm seeing that more and more often with more houses I go into. And you know what? It's multiple things. Part of it is about hedging costs, right? So you have a choice. But it's also about heating certain areas, I, I, at least in our experience, right? Some people want a really warm living room, and so they'll have that wood stove or that help stove in that living room, and then maybe everything else, right? It's a bunch of different reasons why. It's also because we have homes that have been added on to over time, and it's not necessarily one centralized system. But uh, yeah, that's a good, good point. I think there's some benefits to uh, <clears throat> using a non-automatic heating system. Mostly wood is the only one I can think of, but if you're cutting your own firewood, stacking it, moving it, stoking a fire, conservation becomes a lot easier. You're very reluctant to turn up a thermostat, <laughs> you take short showers, and that's, I mean, from doing that for five years now, it, it's, if you're creating your own heat, it's a very different kind of experience where conservation happens easily. It's how I feel actually about going to the dump every few weeks, which is it keeps me in touch with just how much my house is going through because I'm having to go through that exercise. I'll load it in the car. And take it to the dump. Yeah. Uh, go for it. I'm just going to tag up that so I work with you. And um, can you speak up? I work with youth, and so honestly, a thermal efficiency is not what middle schoolers care about. They just don't. But after we did the workshop about which is helping them understand why we should button up our homes and things like this, uh, the exit ticket of one of the students was like, "Wait, if we insulate my house, I get to stack less wood." And it's like you're saying, it's that personal connection, and absolutely. Like, Yes, one person got it. Um, but it, it, it makes a difference when you have some sort of a connection emotionally to, to the Go for it. I think it's also important when you start talking about your energy usage and, and all the different types of energy that you're using, that you look at your whole portfolio and you speak to Efficiency of Vermont and Brock and NeighborWorks of Western Vermont. Because what happens is you'll you'll start to get it. Uh, a lot of us, you know, we get our Green Mountain power bill. We don't even see the bill. It just like automatically comes out of our credit card. And, and same thing with suburban propane. You know, they they just you know, uh, and but it's really important to look at those because what will happen is you, if you get an energy audit, you can start to look at oh well, if I spend X amount on weatherization, well now my heating bill goes down. If I get solar and put in heat pumps, my oil bill goes away, and, and it actually ends up being a cash positive. So you still have a, a couple of options, but, but they can really break it down to you're actually warmer. You, when you read the newspaper in your house, it doesn't blow, and, and you're saving money. Um, so, there, so I think it's really important to bring in the experts for an analysis so they can really have you look at the whole portfolio. John, yeah, can, I, can I add on to that? Um, first of all, I, we, we would be remiss not to mention the fact that the Dorset Energy Committee and the Dorset Planning Commission 
spent a lot of time and effort recently putting together a Dorset Town Energy Plan that has a lot of really good information and recommendations and, and ideas in it. So that, that should be part of the notes. Um, and let me just no note that that actual energy plan is actually a model for other towns around the state. It's really one of the best plans around. So kudos to you. And, and, and the second, as far as the challenge goes, building on what Bill, Bill was saying, and, and correct me if the situation has changed, but we talked about getting, um, you know, Brock is, is great for the, the program that they have for, for the residents, and we understand that they have capacity in our area. But one of the challenges historically in our area has been you might get a, a home energy visit and get excited about getting a, a follow up with an audit and getting weatherization work done. But we have a, had historically a significant shortage of um, home auditing and weatherization contractors in our area. That's an, yeah, so that's a challenge right there. That's a challenge. Yep. Anybody experienced that? So um, you mentioned that you had your home weatherized. Did you have a trouble finding a contractor? Have other people had to find contractors for weatherization or other work? We didn't, but it was probably, I'm going to say, five years ago. I don't know what the situation is now. Yeah. All I know is, my children had been sick because we didn't. We had that cold basement thing, and it's all sealed now, so we're not getting the mold in, and we're not getting the drafts, and we're not. It's we're not getting mice. It's just. It was worth. We had to wait a little while for the guy to come. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't a guy. It was a crew, but it was a really good thing to get the whole thing done top to bottom. A little shout out for both, you know, for having an energy visit is that one of the things they do is the health and sort of wellness, health and safety stuff. That sometimes just having another set of eyes come into your house and look at, you, you, we all get a little bit inert to some of the things going on in our own home, and having someone who's got some expertise who can identify some of those other issues is really passing value. All right. Uh, I think let's shift gears a little bit here, and uh, I guess what I'm uh, hoping to draw out of you at this point are some ideas for what, what Dorset might do, what you all might do around energy, uh, and both energy efficiency, energy generation. This can be a broad conversation. I have to say, I'm not going to say, oh, that doesn't fall under the category of energy and energy efficiency, so don't, don't type that, right? Just come, th there's no bad idea in this conversation. So whatever you have for ideas, uh, and even if they're transportation related, even though we're going to talk about that in, in the forum later, uh, just I, I would say bring, bring ideas forward. Go for it. So why don't we do more micro-hydro? We have a lot of rivers in the pond, and GMP is pretty much a monopoly. And if there were more local places, like the monks that provide landship for EPA, if there was more of that kind of thing, yeah. where um, you didn't have to rely on, you know, hydro for that and all that. And I, I think rather than answer it, we'll just say, how about more micro hydro as an idea? Let's okay. do that. Let's rather than go on to sort of what the pluses and weaknesses and barriers and opportunities are. Yeah, great. Right. Other ideas around energy for Dorset? Go for it, Bill. Community solar. I think we're talking about having getting some affordable housing in Dorset. Um, you know, there are some people who don't have access to so you know, they don't have the roof or, or land. I think the municipality could could look at um, saving a lot of money by community solar. So I throw that out there. And let's define that term for folks. Give them a little more detail. What do you mean by community solar? So if if in, as part of the energy plan, uh, there were um, identified certain areas that are, are more uh, receptive to good solar gain. And so uh, to put an array there, basically everybody in this room could be a participant in that. If you have 50 kilowatt, you could have 5 kilowatt, you could have 5 kilowatt, because you, don't, you can't generate it at your house. The, the school could benefit. I mean, the school has someone on its roof, and so it's benefiting, but uh, the fire departments. So, so the municipality could take advantage of you know, having some of that power generated go to their meters. Or you could have people in the community uh, be able to participate in it. So gotcha. a lot of people can do it on their own residences or their businesses, but um, you also have the opportunity to do it as a, as a community. And that's part of one of the reasons uh, the energy plan needed to be updated, because communities need to identify those spots. And Dorset has done that. Got it. Great. 
Great. Other ideas? I have, a, I have a couple thoughts, and I don't mean to dominate here, but um, one, one is um, Madison's going to help us put together a workshop on advanced wood heat, um, and one of the workshops will focus on residential systems. Um, that'll happen this fall, just putting a calendar. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, I mean, I think that's something that people can look at. And the other thing is getting back to this concern that we have about um, uh, energy efficiency contracting contractors. Um, I think an uh, the opportunity is trying to um, find more contractors who come, would fit into the, the general category of an energy service provider. Right now, we have a lot of fuel dealers, and that's how we get our, a lot of our energy. We get oil or propane. And it's like the, our energy planning kind of has that business model fading out over time, but we don't want that the businesses to be hurt, obviously. So if we could find a way to help them diversify their businesses and maybe for those companies to get into energy efficiency services and alternative heating system, you know, I mean, they have great customer contacts and everything else. So um, there's, there's my, my big idea. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. I was thinking about uh, Bill's suggestion a little bit, you know, sort of a workshop kind of idea for community solar. Why doesn't, why not here at Dorset go me through the winter time, people might be more available at them, have workshops for these different areas. So, we talked about uh, the house efficiency, so if somebody from Fish and Vermont or a contractor could come and do a workshop. I mean, I have to say, I'm pleasantly surprised how many people have shown up just for this forum. <laughs> and I don't know how many of you have really done your house, let's say, from, from an audit to getting work done on. But have a workshop just to explain how it works, why you should do it, what, what the dollars and cents are, and not to mention the comfort and all that sort of stuff. But do it for every one of these different items. One could be done on transportation. Bill talked about electric cars. I haven't had an electric car. There are reasons. And then, having been in business for 40 years, finally got, I woke up and saw the light of, of making that change. Why did I make that change? You know, so I would suggest a series of workshops on these different topics where people could come and get a good education. Uh, because I think a lot of people just don't know very much about these topics. Great. Super. Yes. Yeah. I think that's a skeptical user of utilities, I want to know that if I make a change, that change is going to continue to benefit me. I have a large end in Dorset for 20 years. When compact fluorescence came out, we put them everywhere we could. 35 bedrooms, hallways, 14 living rooms, dining rooms, commercial kitchen, laundry room, blah, 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 blah. And we benefited for a couple of months, and then the utility company went to the legislature sobbing that they just couldn't make it on their rates and they needed an increase. And we saw that our investment didn't really pay off in the long term at all. It only paid off for a short period of time. So I think it's very important to people that if they're going to commit to making a change, that that change will benefit them for the long haul, not the short haul. So tackling the uncertainty that people feel and having some sense of security about what the long term. How lasting is this change going to be? Yeah. That's that's important to people. And sometimes we hear that about technologies too, right? Absolutely. A little reluctance to adopt a new technology because you're uncertain. Well, maybe next year they're going to have something that's even more efficient or, or more cost effective. Right? So better, yeah. Yeah. I'm very happy with what I have right now. I don't like a company that's forcing me to make a change and upgrade that I don't need. Uh, and then they'll say they, they will fail to support the program that I have after a certain period of time. That should be the cons consumer driven, not company driven. Consumers should have choices. Choices are what make us America. Other ideas, yeah. Uh, I know very little about energy. But I do know that in other parts of the world, there has been incredible things that have happened as far as transportation goes, as far as energy. And so I'm wondering 
Do they have the resources to look beyond what we might know here and what happened and some of these other places? I know there was a program last week done about China, and then there was something I saw about Belgium. And there's incredible things that have happened. And if we don't know about them, then we can't make wise choices for the future. Great. Other ideas? What do folks, you know, Becca mentioned the possibility of sort of home visits from Efficiency Vermont. If, if, if we said that was available here in Dorset now, how many folks would avail themselves of a free walkthrough of their home? Let's just see a show of hands to give us a sense of that as, a, as an idea. How many folks feel like that would be useful to them? Would you like the people who have already done it as well? So uh, sure. yeah, okay. I was going to say, ask how many people yeah, are how many people actually yeah. done it, but you'll find there's going to be an additional amount of that. Sure, but sure. How many people have already done it and do feel like they're, oh, yes, yeah, so that's a, a good feel for our audience. How many feel like it would be useful to do it moving forward, I guess? Sure. Yeah. All right, that's helpful. What are some other ideas uh, around this topic? Yes. What about global warming? Do we have to have some plans in place? On the one hand, I mean, I grew up here, and I remember we go for weeks on end where the temperatures would be below zero. We don't have to worry about that anymore. On the other hand, are more and more people going to think about air conditioning their houses? Yep. Is that something we need to start at least thinking about? Yeah. That's going to consume more energy. So planning for that future, planning for the changes that are coming and, and, and tackling those. Yep. And John, the the that Green Mountain Power and the Emerald Ash Borer Beetle charge that you're going to get, that's a global warming tariff that you're paying right now because we never used to have that and now we do. And now they have to address it because it's a problem for them. So, so yeah, we're, it's, it's creeping into our life uh, by now on our bills. Well, and in fact, you can say the same thing about storm costs, right? Yeah. Look at the severity of storms we're experiencing and the outages and the need to do that clearing as a result, right? That is because our weather's changing. It's these costs that get embedded for all of us uh, that are slowly, slowly creeping up. There's, yeah. there's particular to Dorset, because people, there is another cost that's going to be coming, which is to do with our water system. And that's going to be substantial for anybody you know, on town water. And part of the reason I'm holding back to any kind of home kind of improvement is that that's coming. Uh, and, and I think it's probably about almost 200 homes that are affected. And is there a need to upgrade a system that will be born as a cost by those 200 homes? It's a 100-year-old system, so okay. there are things that are going to be There's looming capital costs. There's already 800000 and then they'll probably be close to $2 million okay. by 200 people. Gotcha. So that is coming, and people are, I don't know if they're all aware of it, but it's definitely What are some other ideas? Yeah. Um, I just want to put in a, a work for the community <coughs> project um, to look uh, the people in Dorset to look towards their strengths. And strength is to think as a group. And what might be happening over the next decade is you know, presently there are a lot of subsidies and programs and money available. Uh, people are looking towards things like microgrids or town um, to become sustainable and independent. Some of that money might disappear. And um, things in the market, uh, concerning fossil fuel prices, might change radically. And <clears throat> so um, uh, your strength is to, you know, everybody's thinking individually about. Uh, your individual homes and your installation and LED lights, etc. But your real strength is to act as a group and do something together um, to uh, uh, perhaps make a microgrid for the town. There's a specific idea of microgrid, the town town based microgrid. Be one of, there's a few already in Vermont, but not many. So you yeah, so be one of the first. It's something that, that pays. The one thing that's going to happen over the next century is energy is going to be on the forefront of your, your cost of living, your cost of transportation as we move into heat pumps and electric cars. 
have electricity is going to become more and more important, and the price is going to go up. So uh, if you think about building an infrastructure while there's grants and um, free money available, you do it now. The other thing is um, there's a, just a limit to the amount of uh, net metering capacity that's going to be available. It's all going to be sucked up. It's first come, first serve. And a lot of areas like for gens and et cetera, are, um, it's already filled to capacity. So you get a piece of the grid now, uh, you know, you can hand it on to your the next generation. So if you miss out, somebody from California or Mexico could be on that. So uh, just a little definition of terms, microgrid. How many, I guess, do folks have a sense of what a microgrid is? So a microgrid is, uh, it basically creates, right now the grid is just a massive system, right? Our grid was designed with centralized power sources, sending, transmitting power uh, all, all over the place. A microgrid sort of allows you to create an island such that uh, if there's an outage somewhere else, if you can create that island and you have storage and maybe some renewable generation as part of that microgrid, you actually can sort of uh, create some resilience as a community by creating that island, that little grid, that small grid that you can island and create that's a little bit, that can be independent of the larger grid and larger outages. I don't know, how about you, Jeff? Do you want to add really anything? Really good, put very simply, it's a, it's a circumstance where locally the energy that you're producing and storing is roughly equivalent to the energy that you need. And what, you know, what you when you talk to, uh, about the utility of the future or the grid of the future, it is about lots of small energy sources and many microgrids. Now, there's a long way from here to there, but it's happening, and uh, and there are communities and people and companies who are who are in that forefront and, and leading the way for that. And I think the the low hanging fruit of that is like a building like this. We've got solar on the roof. Um, you know, you could you could have enough batteries in here so that. If the next Hurricane Maria comes through and we lose power for six days, this could be an emergency shelter. Or you could identify other municipal buildings where you could do the same thing. So I think that's, a, that's an opportunity for a little microgrids. Yeah, not too far up the road in Rutland, they've done that with their school, right? They've got a microgrid with storage, some solar generation, such that their school can be that emergency shelter if, if the power goes off a larger larger. Mm -hmm. Is that what all those solar panels are as you go up to Rutland? There's a whole field on them. So, uh, Probably not. Some some solar has a microgrid associated with it. A lot of solar does not have a microgrid associated with it. Most of it doesn't. So, yeah. Just go for it. What happens to those solar panels when they die out and all those chemicals are in them? Where does that go? Uh, I actually can give you a quick answer, which is as part of the permitting process for any solar project, they actually have to address the question of the decommissioning and, in fact, give some financial assurance that those projects will be decommissioned. So they embed that right into the cost of that project to be sure at the end of that 25 or 30 year life that they're properly disposed of at the end of that life. Yeah, the, uh, the net metering laws in Vermont have, have um, a pretty uh, well-defined group metering program, which is pretty, it's pretty unique. Not every state in the country has them. It allows a group of people to form a, a, an energy park, per se, whether it be solar or wind or hydro. And everybody, uh, the utility company is required to take um, whatever your share is in that energy park and that group, uh, credit that to your um, your electric meter. So um, it's uh, something that um, I know a lot of towns and Vermonters uh, have taken advantage of form community uh, energy projects and are doing very well. Um, and the, uh, uh, this area of Vermont is still open, uh, the Dorset area, so it's it's uh, 
unlike other areas, there's, there's a lot of capacity to do. Um, if a group of people want to get together and do something, um, the rules are uh, amenable to that. Go for it. Yeah. I'd also like to add that introducing renewable energy to endorse it is something that can also uh, sustain our local economy. Like um, one billion dollars of fossil fuel revenues leaves the state of Vermont every year. And so by keeping your um, money within the system, it helps the economy. Absolutely. So that's something that helps with renewable energy. Yeah, when you think about when you spend it on fuel oil or gasoline, most of those dollars are heading out of state. Right. Actually, if you spend it on, on electricity or renewable generation, more of those dollars are, are staying, staying right here. Great, great point. All right, a couple more minutes. I'm sort of giving the last call. Throw in a few more ideas here before we, um, we're going to hear from the business. And what are some other ideas uh, that you all might um, might do as a community or as a community. I'm waiting a yeah. second. Ellen, go for it. I'm thinking that there, there might be some way, and I don't want it to be too autocratic, but if anybody that builds would build to solar orientation, it makes so much difference in a house if you're letting it right here, <laughs> waiting them all it up. So yes. <laughs> But um, if it be in a home, to be able to, we don't need any heat in February when the sun is in the right place. It just floods the house. Yeah. And and it's uh, it's very, it's quite remarkable. Of course, as soon as the sun goes down, right up. So might might that be sort of some local codes yes, that reflect but, that? I don't know if that would be offensive to people or not. It, it might be, but it certainly would help. There are other communities that, in fact, have set up sort of higher energy-related building codes. So you wouldn't be the first. Uh, other ideas before we draw in? Yeah, and uh, there was a high school student 20 or so years ago who won a National Science Award in Washington, D.C. for developing something carbon neutral and placed in fast-running streams which Vermont is really good. And it could generate enough electricity to light a tank. I'm sure it was a utility company that bought that up because we certainly as a public have not benefited from that discovery. Do you know anything about that sort of thing? I think I'm gonna defer. I have a little bit of knowledge, but rather than what I, I think we're sort of starting with and ending with the similar idea, which is micro hydro. How do we do smaller level hydro projects that capture energy uh, and put it and put it to use? I, I just in general it would take a lot of water and hydro to, to generate that energy for a town. There, a river, but not a, not a stream. I'll make a reference. There is a wonderful report that Vermont did, uh, did a couple of years ago doing a deep analysis of all the potential sites in the state for small hydro and really um, d doing some analysis. Now, I'm not sure what technological assumptions were embedded in that, but there is some analysis of all those different potential sites. Yeah, a comparison, like over at Lake Madeline, over at the Cartesian Foundation, over the mountain. That's that's a hundred kilowatt dam. Uh -huh. That's just designed for maybe at the most in the spring that make two hundred kilowatts, and that's a major hydro plant. Um, uh, yeah, the Dorset Energy Committee heard this and thought it was a good idea. Some time back, and we investigated all the possibilities in the town, and they really are here. Then Jim went looked at creeps he could imagine. <laughs> You know, in the bushes, I, I tried to do a system actually a long time ago, uh, not talking about the permitting issue, which is the other problem with hydro. Once you're in it, what's the matter in the waterway? It's, it's a, just a nightmare. And, and we investigated the mill pond dam uh, with some improvements and the newest technology for turbine development. And the best we could produce out of that dam was 500 kilowatts, which is. 100, 120 homes, maybe. And the other thing you have to remember, again, somewhat related to climate change, <clears throat> in the permitting process for water over dams, is that there is a lot of variability based on weather. So this spring we had 
and they have a real surplus of rain. We've got a lot of water flowing here. They have had a lot of other years where the dam in Manchester would not have enough flow from a permanent point of view over the top of the dam to run so that, and that, and that would go on for like 90 days. So there's a lot of variability to that. I think production. John, if I, I could just really quickly add to that, I think with the, maybe the technology that is being referred to is like genuine in stream hydro generation where the turbine is like in the flowing water as opposed to a dam, which, which sounds pre pretty cool actually. Uh, but the same thing goes, you need a lot of flow. The, the, the biggest one I know is like a, an experimental turbine in Passamaquoddy Bay that uses tidal flow, bi-directional flow, and it's an experimental, I think it's a 150 kilowatt generator, and that's a lot of water. <laughs> so. All right, I want to, we're st no more on hydro hydro. I'm quickly doing it, because we had a couple more hands before we bring it into the <laughs> Yeah, so um, it's becoming more difficult to get rid of our waste. You mentioned you take it Know, every other week, every week, every week, every realize how much waste we're generating. Um, you know, since the other countries in the world don't want our garbage anymore, we really need to figure out what to do with it. And, and I know that there are parts of the world that use their waste to generate energy, and that might be something that we might want to look at. Um, we might not generate enough waste here ourselves because you know we're green waters. But there's a lot of neighbors around here, neighboring states that generate a lot of waste. Can be a place to go. And there's also, in particular, with compost, uh, sort of uh, that type of material. There's a lot of embedded energy in that type of material, and there are some community efforts around gathering compost and bringing it to commons uh, collection. I, was there a, yes, go for it. So transportation, we're not discussing transportation. Everyone in Dorset has their own car, no one shares a car. What can we do to get some sort, sort of incentive, people to do a communal small bus that people take, no. to get used to uh, having a communal life in the transportation system? All right, we're putting that as an idea. We're going to have a whole session on that oh. uh, in, after this, oh, after okay. dinner, but uh, we'll definitely make note of that. You know what, I'm going to suspend things now. I will say that we will, um, we welcome other ideas. If folks have them, uh, you can certainly, we'll give you ways to get those other ideas in. But I want to really uh, give a chance for our visiting team to provide a few reflections. We have about 10 minutes left. So that gives each visiting team member about a minute or two. Uh, and I'm going to start. Uh, in the middle of the group with uh, our, uh, the chair of the Regional Planning Commission, uh, uh, Jim here, and then let's go around this, this way, I guess. Great, I'll, I'll be the first one over to the dinner table. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I talked about some of the efficiency and alternative energy stuff, just on the, the renewal, renewable generation front. Um, to note that, you know, Bill mentioned community solar and the energy planners in town put a fair bit of time and effort into identifying um, suitable sites for, for, solar for solar generation facilities. So I think, um, you know, just kind of making sure that that information is out and available is, is something to talk about too, as it's like the community solar thing. And then, um, Jason, you, you talked about microgrid and all that, but I think it's, it's worth noting that every time I drive through Dorset on Route 7, I'm reminded that we have a renewable energy uh, a manufacturing facility in Dorset, which is pretty impressive in and of itself. It probably should be mentioned as a, as a resource. Thank you. Yeah. A glaring omission. <laughs> well, as an energy auditor, um, and I do primarily residential homes, Honestly, I, one of the biggest things I've, I've heard is there's Can a lot of opportunity. Can we ask those reflect, stand up? Sure, actually. Sure. Stand up, yeah. Okay. So, a lot, of the, a lot of the emphasis that I see on a day-to-day -day basis is on every individual house. Um, and I can't stress enough that everybody should really take the opportunity to look at their houses and see how they're reacting to climate, what you can do to um, make the changes to help your home become more energy efficient overall. 
A um, couple things that were mentioned were uh, heat pump water heaters, um, things with, with insulation, that type of things. You can, you can always make improvements to those types of things. Thanks, Tom. Amy? Sorry. Uh, what I probably took away from the conversation most was just kind of the, the interest in this topic. I mean, clearly you, you came here tonight so you're interested in energy, but really diving in and wanting to think about a lot of innovative technologies. Um, and also it seemed like there was a theme of energy independence, thinking about more distributed energy uh, versus larger scale, having energy be local and something you can control. Um, and I think one easy, relatively easy thing that you all raised was just more education on some of these topics. So I think moving forward with a lot of the partners here, um, that should be fairly easy to tackle. One thing I didn't hear as a challenge um, was cost, as, as a big challenge at least. Um, but if that is something that's a challenge, when you're running those numbers, as I think someone mentioned, you can often make it cash positive. And there's lots of good credit unions and other folks who can help. Besides standing up, can they tell us where they're from? Just oh, a reminder of where they're yeah. from. All right, great. I'm from Senator Sanders' office. Thank you. And we had uh, uh, Michelle join us later, so I don't think we can reach this up. Okay. Uh, I'm Michelle Buchheimer. I'm with the Agency of Transportation, and I'm going to be facilitating your session after dinner. And um, I think one of the things I took away from your discussion was the idea that seeing is believing, and getting those testimonials or perhaps um, folks who have um, implemented an innovation within their home uh, or in a small community, inviting others to come and see and learn about it, and maybe that's something the Energy Committee can facilitate, and I don't know if you have, do you have Front Porch Forum here in Dorset? Just, yeah, like, you know, maybe through the Energy Committee, getting people who can tell a story. I mean, the storytelling and the sort of hands-on understanding of how my neighbor succeeded in doing something can be really transformational for implementing a new idea. Um, Laura McLaughlin with the Vermont Energy Education Program. And jumping off of your point, one of them I think is the community um, dashboard, the energy dashboard, and I'm not sure if your community is using that, but that could be one opportunity for stories to be told, um, obviously and actions to be listed. Uh, it's, it's a tool that's out there the state runs a community energy dashboard and so you can actually as a homeowner you can list the things that you've done in your own home you can also list things that the community has done it tells you where hydro solar types of generation that are happening inside your town um, so coming from my perspective uh as i deal with youth um there's lots of great opportunities for youth to actually help with that education um, it's really important for, for you. They're the future homeowners, the future drivers, the future bus riders. Um, and so it would be really great to actually get them engaged on some of these. And they're actually uh, a, an avenue for them to share that knowledge with the rest of your community. Mm -hmm. um, certainly this is a small portion of, of Dorset Dors residents. And so um, using the schools and the students to actually help share what, what we talked about tonight um, and having them again learn and teach others would be a great way to get more value to the climate. Uh, Becca White, Efficiency Vermont. Um, so what I want to talk about is the resources that Efficiency Vermont can offer Dorset. You're a target community, which is a good thing. It means that we can provide some amplified incentives and resources for you as a town. Um, so what I heard pretty loud and clear was a lot of folks have done it, a home energy audit, but that might be a little self-selecting. The folks who've done it kind of know. Um, we can offer free home energy visits through this program. I also heard a little bit about the seeing is believing piece and we're doing a button up campaign starting in September, button up your home, button up Vermont. And one of the programs that we're offering is home tours. So if you, I'm looking at you, um, if you weatherize your home and you want to partner with your energy committee, you can open up the parts of your home that have been weatherized and really celebrate that and show people in the community who have either had a home visit and aren't sure what to do or think Thinking about getting a home energy visit. And then the last thing I wanted to highlight is one of the resources that we have 
um, is as a municipality, as a target community, we're willing to offer $4,000 towards a municipal project, up to $4,000 and 90% of the cost of a project. So if there is kind of a small energy efficiency project you think would be valuable, that's something that we can work with the energy committee on. And then last, just education-wise, we're your resource. We can be experts in the field on almost every topic that we've heard tonight, or we're willing to help you find the resource to find an expert in the field. So I'd love to talk to anyone who'd love to engage on that. Hey, I'm Madison Kramer. The Vista with the Huntington County Regional Commission. I've been feverishly typing this whole time, so I haven't had too much time to have my own thoughts. But um, I just wanted to highlight that the BCRC is now engaged with towns um, through their implementation program for energy. Um, so my role as a Vista is really to facilitate workshops and events um, that benefit the towns. Um, so not only do you have this great resource that we have, this is happening in Dorset, but you've got other people who are happy to facilitate you know, the things that you want to prioritize. So, yeah, we'll be having more of it soon. Hey. Let's say again who you represent. I'm the VISTA of the Bennington County Regional Commission. The what? The AmeriCorps VISTA, so it's a one year. AmeriCorps. <laughs> and BCRC. Yeah. I'm Mark Anders, and I work at BCRC, and although my area is transportation, um, one thing I took away from this is just the need for uh, technical information for people. And I love the idea of a forum based on one heat source. And actually, I just a person on it, though, I put in a wood stove last year because we had the Vermont forestry guy at one of the resources and dinners. And he was like, so dark, all about that. And I did it, and I put it in, it's awesome, love it. Um, so I think that's really needed. It's more information for, for people. Yeah. Okay, uh, my name is Jeff Mondrum from Green Mountain Power. Um, we're really focused on a number of things. We're focused on carbon and making sure that the energy that we're getting, that we're using in our homes and businesses is as clean as possible. And for that end, today, right now, the energy supply that comes from Green Mountain Power to your homes is 90% carbon free, 60% renewable. We've got so that's really good, okay? That means that it beats burning oil, it beats a lot of different applications. We've got goals of by 2025 being 100% um, carbon free, and by 2030 being 100% renewable energy. Okay, so those are, those, are, those are big goals, but they represent you know, the level of stewardship and concern that we should all have for the environment. I've heard a lot of conversation during, during our discussion about how the climate is changing. And, you know, we can have a hand in that. It's, we're small as a state, but everybody needs to pull their weight, and this represents an opportunity to do that. So how can electricity best be used? You know, there were some conversations about the cost of electricity, and absolutely, electricity has a cost. But when you look at your total energy cost, and you balance out what you're paying for fossil fuels, what you're paying for electricity, what you might be paying for wood, what you might invest in sweat equity. There's a balancing that happens in all of that. And there are some applications that are really, really good for electricity. Heating air with heat pumps, heating water with heat pump water heaters represent great opportunities. Ground source heat pumps are great. Air to water heat pumps are fantastic and they're starting to uh, appear in, in Vermont. Um, transportation is an outstanding opportunity to use a really efficient um, form of converting electricity into you know, the energy that you're using to get from one point to another. When we talk about dollars, okay, and I, I, I'm doing this from personal experience now because I'm a cold climate heat pump customer, and the break-even point on oil compared to using electricity on use over the year is about two bucks a gallon. So if you're paying two bucks a gallon for oil, you're at parity with electricity. If you're paying more than that, electricity starts to win. The break-even point for electricity on transportation is about a buck twenty-five a gallon. 
So again, if you're driving a car and you're paying more than a buck twenty-five a gallon, and I'm just guessing here, but I think we all are, <laughs> then electricity is a great way to get around. We've got programs that can provide support for all of these things, for climate heat pumps, for transportation. We partner with Efficiency Vermont. We work with commercial and industrial customers. We've worked with folks in this room on really cool projects to help reduce fossil fuel. We can provide incentives to do that, and we do it in ways that make economic sense because we help with economic analysis as we're doing it. So, if you have any questions, I'm here for you. Quickly, one question for Jeff. Okay, so how much of the, you said 60% renewable? Is, is it produced in Vermont or some of that purchased is rent credits? It's a combination. So, and, and understand how the electric market works. And this is a really, this is going to be a really long answer and I know we don't have time for it, but all renewable energy gets converted into renewable energy credits. So I'll just leave that there because all renewable energy comes in the form of credits. That's how they're traded. And so our energy comes from imported energy, from hydroelectric, from a variety of sources, but it also comes from local energy in the form of solar and local hydro. But like the wind, whole wind project, mm -hmm. that, that is not stored energy. That's solar. It's direct credits. That's mm -hmm. that's wind, and it, it it flows right into the grid. So those electrons, and you know, and electrons are indifferent to where they come from. Um, are, are introduced to the grid you're using. All right, I want to, I'm sorry to cut it off. You two could have a over, over dinner conversation. <laughs> That's a, there's the potential for a, a half hour perhaps on that. You know, Jim Salzgiver is one of the co-chairs of the Energy Committee. I just want to give him a quick chance to introduce himself and recognize the other committee. Actually, members. what I wanted to do, uh, yeah, Jim Salzgiver, I'm on the select board, but I'm also on the Dorset Energy Committee. I've been for a long time. I wanted to, since the Dorset Energy Committee has come up a few times, Actually, the members of the Dorset Energy Committee who are here right now, we can kind of stand up so people can know. We've got, you know, Alan Maloney and Jim Hand. They're slow to get out there. Come on, Wilson. It's a shy group. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a, a small group that's gotten a lot, a lot done. Uh, since there are a lot of people here who are interested uh, in, the, in the topic, we actually have a sign-up sheet if you want to learn more or maybe attend a meeting or two of ours. You know, leave your, leave your info on the sign-up sheet because we, we'd love to have a few more people, you know, kind of So I think we've done a lot of good for Dorset, so we can do a lot more. All right. Uh, hey, I want to thank you guys uh, for a really lively conversation. Uh, a lot of good ideas here. And what I would say is never underestimate the power of a committed group of local citizens to get some, some pretty amazing things done. And I think we're at a time where people feel the need to get some pretty powerful things done uh, for our communities and, let's say, for the, for the broader world at this point. So just really want to uh, appreciate all of you for your participation. And I think uh, a pretty amazing dinner has been set up across the room here. So uh, let's go enjoy that. Thanks, everybody.